Kia ora, Chloe. Uh, no mai hadi mai to this little uh, broadcast from the TEU. Thank you so much for coming and answering some questions about what you think the Green Party can pledge to, what you can promise to do if you, if you become part of the next government in New Zealand. And so we're asking you to pledge support for accessible and inclusive quality public tertiary education as it's set out in the government's new tertiary education strategy, a modified version of which actually is due to come out very soon. Um, but it's already a really great document that we feel we've had good influence on. And also the reforms of vocational education, about which we could say the same things. Really. We've had quite an influence there and we're pretty happy with the direction in which that's going. Um, and we're asking you to, to make promises that would make that, that vision live in certain ways. And what's required for that is a new funding model that prioritizes domestic students and skills required in Aotearoa and which recognizes the actual cost of running provision, whether on job, on campus or online. And now the government has committed to that, but we need it to be in place by the beginning of 2022. The government is actually really looking at the beginning of 2025. They're saying the end of 2024 at the moment would be the deadline for getting that uh, unified funding model in place. Can you promise to get it in place by the beginning of 2022? Michael, what I can do. Firstly, kia ora. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, and thank you as well for all of the mahi that you've done to build the mandate to make these things not only possible, but uh, to set those targets in place as a union. So uh, what I can say is that in my role uh, as one of eight Green MPs of 120 members of parliament in parliament this past uh, three years, I have tried to work uh, my hardest alongside Minister Chris Hipkins and obviously Associate Minister Tracy Martin uh, in the area of tertiary education in particular to make sure that we do have that greater funding and those changes. And should I be so fortunate to be in that privileged position to do so again, then I can commit the Greens in principle to working to bring forward that timeline, that horizon from 2025 to as soon as possible. So to the 2022, uh, Yes, 2022 uh, would absolutely be a commitment from us because it's long overdue. Got it, Chloe, that's wonderful. Um, and, and this is a, the second question is quite closely related to that, but uh, can you commit to increasing the funding for the tertiary education sector to 2.7% of GDP by 2024? So that public funding covers the true cost of an accessible and inclusive system across all communities in our so as we were just saying uh, in our kōrero uh, before we came to this recording now, uh, I think that we need to be quite cautious in tying ourselves to a proportion of GDP, noting that in a time of the global pandemic, as un unprecedented as it is that everybody keeps citing, uh, we need to be careful not to bind what could potentially be a cap on funding. That being, if the economy were, for example, you know, unfortunately to end up in a position further down the track of contracting, then we do not want to end up in a place of austerity. So in principle, the Greens would commit to that being um, a floor that we would absolutely be looking to aim at. Great, great, great answer. Thanks, Chloe. And um, yeah, the uh, a third question, uh, again, that relates in a way to funding, um, and, and there is general agreement, I must say, uh, across the sector and, 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 and even some political parties, many political parties, that the funding model is a key really to making uh, the, uh, certainly um, the reform of vocational education work. But would you uh, support removing unnecessary auditing measures from the sector and return this money to improve student support, which has been reduced over the last decade due to funding shortfalls? Funding shortfalls. And there has been as well, uh, as I think many can note from a number of different perspectives and across tertiary institutions, politics and universities, that the competition um, that has been forced upon them has been rife and meant that some, particularly in the ways that boards uh, have been formulated to make decisions subsequent to the reforms of the National Party and the revocation of students, uh, representation in particular, uh, I would say that all of those things together compounding have resulted in poor decisions that have put so-called financial health in front of uh, the educational outcomes, in front of uh, the kind of civic participation that our tertiary institutes are supposed to play the role of in our society. So in terms of removing those unnecessary auditing measures, yes, we can commit to those in principle. 
Great, great. Yes, I mean, most of those are, um, are in abeyance just at the moment because of the crisis, and we hope that that can continue indefinitely. Um, well, now, Chloe, we're just going to move on to some of these questions about equitable workplaces in the tertiary education sector, having covered this question of making sure that all New Zealanders have good access to uh, tertiary education. Um, and can you commit to requiring that all tertiary education providers receiving government funding pay a living wage? What I can say is that Jan Logie uh, has done an immense amount of work, my Green Party colleague in this space, uh, and has found ways and put forward the public proposal, for example, essential workers to be paid a living wage through collective agreements as the lever. So for that to be the lever for introducing that throughout our tertiary institutions, I think would be uh, not only uh, something that would be desirable, but incredibly practical as well. Right, so that would cover cleaners and security guards, yep. those who are struggling at the moment to get that. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. And on that point as well, I'd just like to state uh, that I very much talked about the work that has been undertaken by students who are currently, I think, primarily out of Victoria University of Wellington, organising to support a living wage for um, staff, including our cleaning and security staff at our tertiary institutions. Yeah. I mean, I, having said that, I, I guess I should note that there are still some tutors and others who are also paid below the living wage, uh, people in libraries and elsewhere. So we, I don't know if they are classified as essential workers, but I hope that, you know, you Yes, no, I was simply saying that that's an example of what can be done in the essential workspace where you have uh, groups of people who may be pri previously on individualised contracts to bring them in and ensure that everybody collectively is doing a lot better. We've proven that it can be done in the space of essential workers and therefore it can easily be done. We can copy and replicate that model in the space of tertiary institutes. Lovely, thank you. Yes, thanks for clarifying that. Yes, so, um, and the other uh, ask we have around equitable workplaces is to address inequality in the tertiary education sector by requiring all investment plans to include equity, equity implementation plans for Māori, women and Pacifica staff and learners, and to ensure that there is funding to achieve these plans. So, yeah. I think I can say uh, without a kind of shadow of a doubt that the party which will probably be the most on board with those equity plans and lenses would probably be uh, the Greens with our very, very staunch co kaupapa on making sure that uh, all of those who are marginalised by traditional models or ways or systems of doing things, uh, we want to make sure that they are accounted for and therefore supported. Kia ora, Chloe, that's wonderful. I mean, are there any final remarks you'd like to make about how you see support for tertiary education unfolding in the future and how you'd like to see it? I think um, as somebody who actually is currently a postgrad a student at Victoria University of Wellington, uh, studying my uh, certificate in public policy, focusing primarily on economics, but also um, very frequently interacting with uh, tertiary students in particular through the likes of the student accommodation inquiry that we got up over the first lockdown. And as uh, somebody who uh, really paid a whole lot of attention to the way that educational support, particularly from a distance, unfolded during that first lockdown and the statements made by Iona Holstead, which is seared into my brain that, you know, this uh, crisis, this pandemic didn't create inequity, it merely exposed it. I think that uh, the massive challenges that are now being presented to our tertiary institutions with uh, the pullback of international students has really exposed that we were uh, upholding a truly unsustainable system uh, by virtue of just pulling in more and more so-called export education um, in a very unsustainable manner. So re-gearing and reorienting our uh, tertiary sector so that it is truly sustainable, it is truly inclusive, and also that we have the ability to train everybody who wants to get the education so they can contribute as best as possible uh, is for me I think the key to a fair and equitable Aotearoa. Kia ora. brilliant, thank you Chloe. Kia ora. thank you for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure.